Hi there, Francois. Hello, Matt. Hello, Martin. So, um, how are you doing today? Um, I'm fine. I'm really happy to to be here and to open the day. Uh, it really it is really an honor for me to to open the day two of uh, JetBrains.net Day Online. Um, and the the agenda yesterday was already awesome. Uh, I've learned a lot of things, and I, I'm sure I will learn a lot of things today too. So, really happy to be there. Yeah, may, maybe a nice question for the people in the chat as well. Um, who here has been watching the stream yesterday as well? And who's going to watch it entirely today? Curious to see yeah. that. We, yeah. we had a lot of good comments yesterday, a lot of people from uh, all around the world as well, which is really nice to see. So uh, let us know where you're from and, you know, who's the furthest afield. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the UK, Martin, you're in Belgium. Francois, where are you today? Uh, I'm based in Paris. Um, ah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, we've got a couple of people. We've already got some uh, comments there. Uh, Paul Graham as well, stuck in bed with COVID. So he's going to be definitely tuned in for the whole day uh, with us. <laughs> it, it's uh, great so to see people providing. watching us both days. Yep, exactly. So um, we hope that uh, a whole day full of technical talk can make you feel better. Exactly. So Francois, if you are ready for it, um, let's add your screen. Yeah, and then uh, I guess you can kick it off. Uh, you have the honor of being the first presenter today, so um, I'm going to remove Matt and myself from screen, and then you are good to go. Good okay, luck. Thank you, and thanks for uh, making me the honor to be the first presenter today. Um, and I want to discuss about a topic uh, which is really important uh, to me. It's how to build cloud native application, uh, especially with .NET and uh, AWS. Uh, and um, I will start by taking the time to review what is a cloud native application, uh, because uh, I think if I had a question, uh, I, I would get um, as much uh, uh, answer as there is people watching uh, the live stream. Um, so I will start by reviewing um, the definition of a cloud native application, or, and then I will discuss how we can uh, build uh, an architecture, a cloud native application to solve a business problem. And then I will uh, go uh, to, into a demo, a live demo, uh, try to build this application. But uh, let's start by uh, uh, reviewing um, the definition of cloud native application. And I would say that the, the only I would say official definition of cloud native uh, is the one given by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, so let's uh, read it uh, together. So cloud native technologies empower organizations to build and run scalable application in modern dynamic environments such as public, private, and hybrid clouds. So the first important um, uh, things here is that uh, there we are discussing cloud native technologies and they help uh, these cloud native technologies help to build application, the application that we call cloud native application. And one of the characteristics of these cloud native applications that we want to build is to be scalable. We want uh, this application uh, ready to handle uh, high traffic uh, and uh, to be uh, able to go uh, nearly down to zero to if there is no traffic. Um, so let's continue to read the definition. So containers, service meshes, uh, microservices, and uh, immutable infrastructure and declarative APIs exemplify this approach. And here again, uh, there is uh, an important thing. I've heard too many people uh, making a direct link between containers and uh, cloud native. Um, Containers, uh, don't get me wrong, containers are really important to cloud native technologies, as well as Kubernetes, for example, but they are not cloud native technologies. They are uh, an example of what is cloud native technology. And, and uh, using containers doesn't mean that you are building a cloud native application. Uh, for example, if you take a a good hold, a monolithic application that you struggle to to move forward and to modernize, and you containerize this uh, good old monolithic application. Um, it won't it won't transform uh, this monolithic application in, into a cloud native application just because you've 
containerize this application. So don't make this mistake. Uh, containers are an important part of the cloud native technologies, but they are that doesn't mean you are building cloud native application. And then um, let's uh, read the second paragraph. This technique enable loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. So these are important characteristics of cloud native applications. They must be resilient, manageable, and observable. And combined with robust automation, they allow engineers to make high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimal toil. So that's um, the definition of what is cloud native, and it helps to understand what is a cloud native application. So basically, a cloud native application is a scalable application that is resilient, manageable, and observable, and that leverage cloud native technology to, uh, to succeed with these characteristics. So now that we have common definition of what is a cloud native application. Let's move forward. Um, and I want to discuss um, a, a real uh, business use case, um, the one of I Love My Local Farmer. So I Love My Local Farmer is a fictional, fictional online marketplace. It's, it's a fictional company. Uh, I've built this fictional company, uh, the story of this fictional company with some colleagues because uh, we needed a way to share some deep technical uh, details on some uh, implementation. And uh, we've seen uh, uh, when working with our customers, and of course we don't, we can't, and we don't want to share uh, technical uh, implementation of our customers. They are their secret sources, so we don't want to share uh, their secret source. So we've built this fictional company to be able to tell the story of this company and to share some technical details. This company is a uh, fictional online marketplace that helps a consumer to buy fresh and local produce to the farm near them. Um, and so to, to sell on this marketplace, farmers need to register into the platform. And to register to the platform, uh, right now they have to send proof of address documents uh, to the company and uh, op human operators will uh, review the documents and uh, when once they've uh, manually processed them, they will store these documents uh, into a proof of address database. And um, the business stakeholder want to uh, automate this manual workflow uh, to um, to speed up the regis registration time uh, of farm new farmers on the platform and to reallocate um, uh, the workforce uh, to more valuable tasks. And they've asked the B2B development team to uh, automate this process. And the B2B development team is a .NET development team. So let's see how uh, they've decided to, to build uh, the applications that will automate this process. So first, farmers will uh, navigate to uh, Blazor WebAssembly single page application. Uh, this uh, single page application is served by a content delivery network. Um, here we are using Amazon CloudFront. It's uh, AWS uh, cloud, uh, develop, uh, cloud de delivery network. Uh, and um, if the single page application content is not yet in the cache, um, it will ret retrieve the single page uh, application content from uh, an Amazon S3 bucket. So basically uh, an Amazon S3 bucket is an online object storage. Once the single page application is loaded, uh, the farmers will be able to log into the platform. So the login request will be redirected to a backend for front end API hosted by uh, AWS AppRunner. So basically, AWS AppRunner is a service that allows you to run a containerized web API. And uh, just by asking the service to deploy your container and to handle the load balancer for you. So you just have to build your containerized web API and ask the service to run it for you, to handle the load balancer for you, to handle the, the, the scaling of the number of container instance running behind the load balancer for you. You just have to build your container. And the 
The container on the backend for Fontaine API will uh, check credential and permissions against a user store. Here we are using Amazon Cognito uh, as our user store. And once the farmers are logged in, uh, we will retrieve a pre-signed URL from uh, an Amazon S3 storage so that um, the farmer will be able to directly uh, upload documents to Amazon S3 without uh, going through uh, the backend for Fontaine API. So once the Amazon S3, uh, the, the file is uploaded on the Amazon S3 storage, uh, Amazon S3 will send a message to a queue for further processing. So uh, here we are using Amazon SQS as our queue uh, middleware. And um, Amazon SQS will then trigger uh, a background task. Here our background task uh, will run on AWS Lambda. It's our uh, serverless uh, function uh, service. So here you just write the piece of code uh, that um, handle the business uh, requirement of your uh, processing. And you don't have to care about managing servers, deployment, it's it's all handled for you. So here my our background task will um, call Amazon Textrax, uh, an AI uh, services that will uh, perform a form analysis of you, the, docu the uploaded document and uh, return uh, all the text that has been um, identified. And then our background task will store this information in a NoSQL database. Here we will use Amazon DynamoDB. So with this architecture, we've we are building a cloud native application. We are leveraging um, serverless uh, services where you don't have to um, handle uh, uh, and, um, to handle servers, uh, auto scaling um, is managed for you. Resiliency is managed for you because all this service has been uh, um, have been built uh, by this are uh, by design resilient. Sorry, um, so you it's already uh, managed for you. And let's see uh, now uh, how we can build this application. And let's uh, switch to. Um, the browser, I want to showcase the application first. Okay. So this is my Blazor WebAssembly single page application through, uh, served by uh, CloudFront, our content delivery network. So let's go. Let's go back. I just want to show you the sign in. Um, workflow. So here I can sign in. I'm redirecting to the Amazon Cognito uh, logging page. I can sign into the application. It is. And now that I'm signing, I can uh, choose a file and just uh, upload this file. Okay, it's a, a real document, so I can upload my file. And this file, uh, I've been Upload it to Amazon S3. So let's go into uh, the AWS console. So now I'm in the AWS console and I can uh, click on um, my Amazon S3 bucket. So a part of the application is already built and deployed. Uh, so here I have my file storage Amazon S3 bucket. And here I, I have one folder and one object. This is a file I've just uploaded uh, into uh, Amazon S3 thanks to my application, okay? Okay, this part of the application is already built and deployed, but now I want to, uh, uh, when a um, file is uploaded to my Amazon S3 bucket, I want to um, send a message to uh, Amazon SQS queue. So first we need to create this queue. So let's go to the Amazon SQS uh, service and let's create a queue. Deadbrand.net uh, days. Um, so we can uh, leave uh, all, all the settings. Right with the default value. Let's create this queue. 
Um, okay, that's it. My queue is already available, so I, I can start to work with my uh, my queue middleware. Um, so now I want to uh, uh, allow my Amazon S3 bucket to send message to my um, to to my queue. Uh, okay. So I will edit my queue and I will go uh, here in my access policy and I will copy paste an, an access policy I've already prepared before just to uh, instruct uh, us uh, to give access to the Amazon S3 uh, service. So here I, I'm uh, instructing Amazon SQS to that if the F3 uh, service want to send a message. So the action is SQS send message. Uh, it's okay. So, and here I, I, um, I define which um, queue. So my, uh, the queue I've just uh, created. That's it. So now I can uh, save the settings. So now let's go back to uh, my um, Amazon S3 bucket. So here is my file storage uh, service. Um, and now in the properties of my Amazon S3 bucket, I will uh, set up an event notification. And here I will create an event notification um, um, I want to create a notification only for um, uh, files that are uh, created inside the upload uh, folder. So here we call it prefix. And I want to be notified for all uh, uh, objects that are created. And here I want to send my um, notification to my Amazon SQS queue. So here I can choose my queue and save changes. And I'm all good. So no, um, let's try to upload once. Let's go back to my Amazon SQS queue. Okay. Um, let's. And I got one message available. It's the first message. Let's try to upload one more file. And if I refresh my page, I should have no two message available. Hmm. Demo effect. Nice. Okay. Um, it should be good. Uh, I will. So now I come back to, to this later, but tr um, the message will uh, will be uh, triggered and sent. So now I want to, to build the Lambda function that will consume um, uh, this uh, message. So let's go to Rider. Okay, so here I'm in Rider, um, searching for my, okay. So um, here I'm in Rider, and you can see uh, this is my um, solution, my .NET solution, and uh, I've already created uh, some projects. So the web project is my Blazor WebAssembly application. Uh, the API project is my backend for frontend uh, API. I won't go into uh, all the detail of this API, but uh, this API is uh, calling so for example, uh, this API uh, has a pre-sign controller and this pre-sign uh, controller, okay, um, interact with my, um, with my Amazon S3 bucket to get a pre-sign URL. So this is the, the backend for frontend API that uh, in the, uh, this part. So now uh, I want to create, um, 
uh, lambda function. So let's add a new project to the solution. And let's uh, select um, lambda. Uh, so lambda simple uh, SQS function. And let's uh, give it a name and task. Create it. Okay. So it is. Sorry, I'm str I'm straining a little bit because now. Uh, my cursor is not visible on my screen, so I need to uh, uh, look at uh, on the stream to see my cursor. So it's a bit real. I don't know why. Yeah. So that's why I, I'm a, uh, I'm a bit uh, struggling with uh, the ID right now. Uh, so it is my uh, lambda function. So basically, it's just one class, and here um, uh, I define a function handler. So AWS Lambda will call this function. Here I'm receiving a SQS event uh, object and a, a Lambda context object. So basically the Lambda context object uh, give me uh, the ability to have some info about um, the Lambda environment, the, the environment variables uh, to get access to the logger, for example. Uh, like you can see here, uh, I can uh, uh, call the context object and uh, retrieve the logger to uh, log information. And here I can, uh, so in the SQS event message, uh, uh, the method is iterating um, on each record uh, inside the event object because uh, AWS Lambda can process um, multiple uh, messages at once. So now I want to deploy this Lambda function. So let's go to the terminal. Um, so yeah, I should be in the right. Okay. Okay, and now uh, I will uh, use an um, extension, a .NET uh, extension that we provide to work with uh, Lambda, and I will just uh, call the deep. So you can see we have a, a lot of uh, command here. And I will call the AWS uh, Lambda deploy function. So uh, I'm not in the right directory. Sorry about this. OK. So it will build my uh, my Lambda project. Um, so as you can see here, uh, my uh, Lambda function is built for uh, Linux um, uh, because Lambda is running on Linux. Uh, it will pack my uh, uh, application, um, my Lambda function uh, as a zip file, and it will ask me, uh, OK, enter a function name. So let's call this Lambda function background task. And it will deploy, um, I think. And here it uh, asks me for an IAM role, so um, permissions that I want to associate to my Lambda function. So I've already um, prepared a Lambda role with the right permission to interact with Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon uh, TextRack. So I will reuse this, uh, this role. OK. So now my Lambda function is um, is deployed. So let's uh, go back to, OK. OK, so let's go back to um, the AWS uh, console, and let's go to the Lambda console. 
For now, you can see here on my Lambda function that has just been deployed. Um, and now I want to add a trigger. So here I will configure a trigger uh, and select a source. Uh, so here I want to use uh, SQS as a source. And here I want to select a queue. And I can uh, uh, define my batch size here. So I will let with the default value. Uh, we can have um, additional settings, but here uh, I'm all good. And I cr can create uh, the trigger. So the trigger is being created. So it's pretty straightforward. So while uh, the trigger is being created, uh, so that's that's it. So it's already there. So let's go now to my uh, file, uh, to my application, and let's upload once again a new a new file. Okay. Let's go to my lambda function. Let's go to monitor, and here from the monitor uh, tab, I can go uh, and view my lambda function logs into CloudWatch. So let's go to CloudWatch because uh, I've, I've uploaded um, a new file, uh, my Lambda function should be triggered. Okay. So yes, it has been triggered. So I can see here. So right now uh, it's just uh, right on the message it received. Okay. It's a test event and here another message. Yes, object created put. So I've received my message. So in a few minutes, uh, I've created a SQS service. I've uh, set up the event notification from my Amazon S3 uh, bucket to uh, Amazon SQS. I've created a Lambda function and um, and I've uh, set up uh, the trigger between SQS and my AWS Lambda function to uh, to to upload uh, to trigger my AWS Lambda function, and it is already up and running. So now let's uh, go to uh, Rider once again, and let's uh, do something more uh, meaningful. Okay, uh, so I. We want to first add a few NuGet package um, to the project. So we want to add the Textract NuGet package uh, to interact with uh, Amazon Textract service. So let's um, let's install this package. And we also want to interact with DynamoDB. So let's uh, add this package too, okay? Okay, they have been installed, perfect. So, um, Read, give some space to the code, and now, uh, unless I've prepared some code snippet, uh, let's um, let's add some uh, some code to uh, so here. Just import uh, the missing. Okay. So here I add some code and I uh, want to uh, parse my uh, SQS message here, retrieve some properties. So what I'm retrieving here is the bucket name where my file is stored and the key name. So the ne name of the file in the storage uh, to be able to, um, to process uh, this file. And then I send this info to, analy uh, to an analyze document method that I need to create. And then uh, I will store the result in uh, using a store anal analysis results method that I need to create too. So let's 
create uh, the analyze document method. So this uh, analyze document method um, is here and uh, it is using Amazon Textract client to interact with the Amazon Textract service. And uh, to, so here I'm preparing an analyze document request. So basically uh, I prepare an object uh, where I give the info about the file I want to analyze, which type of analysis I want to run. And I just uh, query, uh, request the service to run this uh, analysis by uh, using the analyze document async method on uh, the client object I've just created before. Um, this service uh, return, um some uh um some uh data that i need to uh, then process to retrieve the key value pair that it has uh, detected inside the document the algorithm to process the result is uh, given in uh, into the amazon extract uh, documentation i so i won't go into the detail of this algorithm to process the result and just to to rebuild the, the key pair value, uh, I'm just I've just just implemented the the algorithm given in the documentation. Um, now that I've retrieved this info, I want to um, store the analysis result into an Amazon um, DynamoDB uh, uh, table. So. Uh, I will add this uh, method, so store analysis results. Here again, I'm just using the same pattern. I create um, an Amazon DynamoDB client. And you see here, this is the same pattern for every AWS services. For every AWS services, you have a, a client object. And for this uh, client object, you create, a re you create a request object. Um, you, you call the method you want to call passing this request object and you retrieve a response object. So here I'm uh, preparing a document object and uh, call the put item uh, method from on my table just to store the object. And that's it. I've stored my, uh, my data, my result into DynamoDB. Uh, so now let's go back to the terminal and let's redeploy uh, my Lambda function once again. So it will rebuild everything. Okay. Um, yep, yep, yep. Just once again, I'm unsure if it has um, updated my, my Lambda. I don't know why, just checking. It should be good, let me uh, check. Okay, so let's go into uh, AWS Lambda and just check. Um, if my Lambda function has been updated. No, it hasn't been updated. Why? Uh, demo effects, sorry about this. Okay, uh, let me check. Just quickly jumping in, um, I yeah. think there's still a compilation error in your file. So if you click in the in the scroll bar on the right hand side, there's this red stripe. Yeah, there you go. There's a string builder. Oh yes. 
It's a good call out. Thank you. No worries. Uh, okay, that should be good. Missing this one. So now it is building my uh, the update of my package. And I give my name and now uh, it detects that my function already exists. So it updates uh, the code of my function online. So let's go uh, to um, the portal once again, and uh, I can see that uh, this time. Yes, it's all good. It has been deployed. So let's. So first, let's go to uh, DynamoDB. So in Rider, if I go in uh, Rider, uh, what I didn't show you is that you can interact uh, with uh, AWS uh, services uh, right into Rider thanks to the AWS toolkit. So here I can go to my DynamoDB and go to my proof of address. Uh, and I've already uh, one uh, item inside my uh, proof of address, okay? So let's, uh, let's uh, upload a new file. Okay, let's upload a new file. And let's go back to Rider. And let's run once again. And you see a new item has been uh, put into my DynamoDB table uh, near in real time. It didn't take long to upload my file um, send a, a message to my SQSQ, trigger the AWS Lambda function that uh, has uh, processed the file, uh, call uh, Amazon Textract, retrieve the result, and store the result in my DynamoDB. It's already there, so it works. In a few minutes, I've been able to, to build all this and to add some capabilities to my, uh, to my function, to my application. So let's go back to, uh, to the slide now. Um, okay, I've lost my cursor once again. Okay, that's good. So let's let's wrap up. Um, so what we've seen, uh, it's um, standard C sharp uh, and .NET for Blazor WebAssembly and Web API. It's really standard C sharp. There is no magic here. Uh, we've leveraged AWS services through the AWS SDK for .NET. So when you want to interact. Uh, with an AWS services uh, from .NET, just use the AWS SDK. You can interact with AWS services uh, directly from Rider. And uh, with all the service I've uh, demonstrated, uh, you don't have to manage server. So I really recommend you to leverage serverless and container services uh, to speed up your development process. Um, what we haven't seen to build a cloud native application uh, is how we can fine tune permissions to apply leads privilege policy. Uh, I, I've set up um, some permission for the Amazon SQSQ, but we should do this for every services to ensure that only um, the right, uh, only uh, the required permission are, are set up. Uh, we should also need to add logging and tracing to our application leveraging CloudWatch. We already uh, did it for um, uh, the Lambda function, but we, we should use a CloudWatch and X-Ray everywhere in every part of the application. And of course, we need to automate deployment uh, of this application. Um, I've already did it uh, at some, uh, some uh, extent because I'm using the AWS Cloud Development Kit to provision the infrastructure required by the application. Um, but it was not the topic of the day, so I, I won't go too much into the detail. So my key takeaways for, for you is really leverage cloud-native services 
um, all the services I've demonstrated, and you can find the other uh, these kind of services uh, in other cloud provider, uh, will help you to to build uh, faster your application. You you don't have to uh, rebuild the wheel each time, um, and uh, it helps you to focus on your business requirements. Uh, rather than uh, focusing on uh, the technology and the middleware you want to use before building your application. So you can try it out. Uh, you can explore uh, .NET on AWS. Uh, we have a landing page. We have also some uh, workshops that you can um, uh, run by yourself. And the code of this session, so the source code of this uh, application is available on GitHub, so you can uh, give it a look too. Um, so I, I really thank you for uh, your attention. And if you uh, have questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Francois. That's, uh, that's an awesome session. And I had no idea that there were so many small building blocks that you could, could combine. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not a cloud developer. I don't don't use sort of the, the cloud tooling there. And uh, I was surprised you can just sort of plug and play all of these sort of uh, um, services together there. Um, th there's there's a load of them, though. It looks like there's, there's lots of different things you can plug together and, uh, you know, build like Lego blocks and something like that. So is there is there like, um, uh, I don't know, so some uh, overview of all the different services that you've got available there, some sort of reference architecture or something like that? Um, yeah, we, we provide some um, some reference architecture for uh, we provide a, a, a lot of uh, reference architecture, but I think the best is even when we provide uh, what we call uh, AWS solutions. Uh, basically, uh, AWS solutions are quick start um, for infrastructure. Okay, I want to build a, uh, a farm of servers with a load balancer and you can uh, use one of our, our AWS solution and it's already plugged in. You just have to deploy the infrastructure. And we have the same for what I've sh uh, just shown uh, this morning um, with um, SQS and uh, Amazon S3. So it's really kind of building blocks that you can quick start your system. It's already, um, there are already uh, connected together. You just have to deploy the infrastructure and you can start. And you just have to build your application and use the deployed uh, AWS resources. That's really, that's really cool. Um, another thing I noted as well, when you're talking about the, the cloud native application, uh, you described it, uh, was it a, a public cloud, a private cloud, and also hybrid. And again, not coming from the cloud developer space, what's a hybrid cloud? Could you explain that one a bit more for me? Yeah, um, hybrid cloud uh, is really when you, we have customer, uh, they have uh, needs, for example, in manufacturing, they have needs for um, a low latency, very low latency uh, application. Uh, and some part of their application needs to run inside their manufacturer, uh, for example. Uh, it's the same for um, video games, for example, we they need a low latency. so. They want to run some uh, part of their application at the what we call at the edge. That's why we have a local zone, for example, and and stuff like this, where you can really uh, put some part of your application uh, near to your uh, end customer um, to reduce latency, for example. And we do provide um, uh, some solution for this, like uh, Amazon Outpost. So Amazon Outpost is a kind of appliance that you can. Um, install into your own uh, uh, locals in your office and run by yourself. It's connected to AWS, so you can build. So it's basically uh, AWS services inside your uh, your uh, inside your building. Oh, so, so, so you it's can, actual hardware. Sorry, it's actual hardware. Yes, it's actual hardware. Yeah. Yes, it's hardware oh, that cool. you install um, install into your offices, and uh, you can deploy using the the same uh, AWS APIs that you would use if you were using uh, AWS uh, public cloud. And we also have some uh, discussing about container or some other uh, products that helps you to uh, be a, a hybrid, like um, Amazon EC, uh, Amazon EKS for Elastic Kubernetes Service Anywhere. So basically, we give you the ability to deploy the same 
uh, Kubernetes distribution that we deploy uh, inside AWS with Amazon EKS into your own, onto your own servers into your building. And the same with Amazon ECS. ECS is uh, Elastic Container Service. Uh, you can uh, use Amazon Elastic Container Service anywhere to deploy this uh, service on top of your own servers, for example. All right, that sounds um, really cool. Um, I mean, speaking of the different services and everything, the text extract yeah. um, service, that, that looked pretty cool. Um, what, what sort of capabilities does does that have? What, what other kind of things does it do? Can it work with uh, handwriting and stuff? Does it, does it need um, a document structure which you have to work with? Um, so we, we have the uh, different um, different service. Um, text track and, uh, works. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't want to, to say something wrong because uh, we have different service. We have Amazon Text Tract. Text Tract is, is more about detecting uh, the structure of the document and retrieving uh, the text inside some structured document. We also have Amazon uh, Recognition, which is more about uh, text recognition and, and writing recognition when there are, there are, uh, there is only text in or unwritten text in in the picture to to process. So yes, we have different service with very specific uh, that. Uh, as usual with uh, AWS, we, like you say, we are it's Lego building blocks, mm -hmm. and some sometimes some building blocks overlaps, but they are really um, built on purpose for specific requirements. So sometimes it feels that they overlap, but if you uh, take a look at the details um, feature, you, you will see that oh, this service is more uh, will uh, match more of these technical requirements while this, this other service will be more suitable for this use case. Yeah, it's very, it's very I, cool. I did like that text extract yeah. one. I actually have a small uh, follow up on that text uh, service because I, I also think it's really cool. Do you have to train it or does it just recognize like most common types of documents like invoices and things like that? No, the, it's uh, really a pre-trained AI services. So um, the idea is really to uh, help developers that want to add some AI capabilities to their application to just use the service without having to uh, gather all the data you need to train uh, uh, a good AI model. Because the, the biggest issue when you want to tra train an AI model is to gather training data and to uh, it's it's the it's the new oil for uh, machine learning. It's all the data you need to gather to 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 train the model. So uh, we want to provide pre-trained service for uh, developers so that they can really have this capability without the heavy lifting to train a model by themselves. That's cool. Um... Also, you mentioned the Lego blocks or building blocks a couple of times. And as we all know, Lego can be an expensive hobby as well. Uh, what would your your example cost to run? Um, like more or less, not in detail, but just a general figure. Yeah, with, with all the service um, uh, I've showcased here, uh, most of the services uh, I've used um, have a free tier. So if you don't have uh, much traffic, you won't pay uh, anything because uh, you will stay in the free tier. Um, and if you go, if you're if you're lucky and your application is successful, you will go uh, above the free tier. And then, um, as I'm using um, serverless services, you pay for what you use. For example, uh, for uh, AWS Lambda, you pay for uh, for uh, the execution time. Um, so if your uh, Lambda function run during 100 milliseconds, you will pay only for 100 milliseconds of execution, and that's it. For Amazon Cognito, you will pay per user. So if you have, I don't know, uh, 50 user, I think, um, I don't know the limit of the free tier, but uh, you will pay per user. And uh, in addition, you will pay per, um, you have, um, logging request included and then if you go above the number of uh, logging requests per month you will pay for each uh, additional uh, logging request for example so it's always a uh, uh, with serverless it's always a, a, a consumption model okay you pay for what you use so if you're successful you pay uh, you pay for what you use and if your application is not used you don't pay 
but indeed it's it's a it's a complex topic it's uh you are when you architect an application no you should take into account um how much will it cost but i, I think that also uh, sort of plays into how you would architect your application right because if you use serverless and you know that you will pay lots of money because you're just invoking it continuously then maybe choosing like a virtual machine or ec2 is the is the better approach there so yes yes definitely it's um it's uh, that's why you you see sometimes some people saying oh uh, we've moved from uh, lambda to um eks or ecs because yes if they have a a constant load uh using uh, this kind of service can be uh, um, more efficient from a, a money perspective yeah definitely so yeah. it's really about using the service that is uh, tailored for your needs. That makes that makes total sense. Um, a more detailed question from someone in the audience. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you can answer it. Um, I'll, I'll try to do my best with the acronyms as well because I'm not familiar with all of them. Uh, but can S3 trigger SQS directly without an SNS between them? Y yes, uh, that's what I did uh, in this. Um, in this demonstration. So S3 is the Amazon storage uh, service, um, and it can trigger, um, and it can send event notification to an AWS Lambda function. Um, so here I could have uh, a void to introduce a SQS queue uh, between my Amazon S3 storage and my AWS Lambda function, but I want uh, it's on purpose because uh, maybe I, if there is an issue, I want to to be able to uh, resume uh, by consuming the content of my uh, SQS queue. So yes, Amazon F3 can trigger uh, SQS without uh, uh, SNS in between, definitely. And SNS is for simple notification service. It's a service that will receive uh, an event and then notify multiple uh, subscribers of this uh, event. I see Matt nodding. He's, uh, he's probably well, wondering where do I learn about all of those acronyms? Yeah, I'm just pleased you explained what SNS was then. <laughs> yes. Yes, we, we try to be careful with acronyms. So uh, SNS is Simple Notification Service, SQS is Simple Queue Service. Um, we, we try to be careful with this because, yes, um, uh, sometimes it's overwhelming all these acronyms. So. Uh, we we have um, we have um, on Amazon uh, on AWS website we have uh, the list of all of our services and um, with the detail of what they do. Uh, so yes, we you can uh, you can go to the AWS uh, website and and discover all AWS services, their name, their uh, what they, what their meaning and what their goals. That is cool. Um, Maybe on the same topic, not learning acronyms, but learning about cloud native. Um, question from the audience. Is yeah. there a recommended learning path or something if you want to go from just a regular .NET developer to a cloud native developer? Um, yes, we, uh, let me. Um, in, this, in this slide, uh, you will find in, in the first, uh, on this first link, you will find uh, the relevant um, course that you can follow to learn .NET on AWS and, uh, and, um, and move from a regular .NET developers to uh, uh, cloud native .NET developers. Um, we have some course uh, on um, plural side on, um, crafted by Julie Lerman, for example. Um, and so, their course, uh, her courses are amazing. So I, I would recommend uh, Julie Lerman uh, courses, definitely. Uh, so yes, uh, if you go to this URL, you will find all this uh, information. Cool, thanks. Uh, not sure, Matt, is there anything you want to add or, or ask? 
Um, I was just going to comment, I think, uh, also, I'm not sure if it was on your slides there, um, to make sure that folk, folk know that there is an AWS toolkit as a plugin to make sure that uh, if you're using Rider to download that as a separate plugin, it doesn't come bundled, um, as far as I remember. So yeah. um, that, that's useful for a, a bunch of different features in there. Um, yeah, but it's for example, not bundled. Yeah, what I love uh, is to be able to um, access my logs in AWS CloudWatch uh, right from Rider. I don't need to go when I'm testing. I don't need to go into the AWS console. I can just uh, access my CloudWatch logs directly from Rider um, and see what's going on. So yes, that's definitely a very convenient uh, uh, extension uh, to Rider when you work with uh, AWS. Awesome, yeah. Um, we, we were also discussing a little bit in the background uh, about about yeah, building your own side projects, and I think there's a lot of inspiration in uh, in your talk and in everything we've seen so far to build more side projects. Like I said, I'm definitely triggered by the text track thingy. Yeah, I might actually look into that one. Yeah, and we we have a lot more. Um... Um, AI services, pre-built AI services that you can use about uh, video, uh, about uh, image recognition, uh, speech recognition as well. So, so as developer, we even if you don't know anything about AI and machine learning, now you can use this API and really uh, start adding this, those capabilities in, inside your uh, application. It's at uh, one API request from your application. It's um, you don't even have to craft the request. You just use the AWS SDK for .NET and it's there. So yes, um, that's something also that uh, really, um, in my opinion, uh, it's uh, the, va the added value of using a public cloud provider is all these pre-built services uh, that you will, it would take you uh, weeks or months to, to build the same uh, services, so uh, you can use them for a proof of concept, for example, uh, to, to build something very quickly, uh, test the ID and see if it's successful or not. Um, and maybe at some point you will build your own AI, uh, AI model, but at the very beginning, you don't want to invest on this uh, before knowing if the, the business ID is successful or not. Cool. All right. Um, definitely inspired by everything you've been uh, been showing, but I think we're uh, yeah we're close to ready to move on to the next speaker and uh, and let you go. Thank you, Francois, for kicking off the day. Thank you for uh, Thank enlightening you. us about cloud native applications on AWS as well. Um, is there anything you want the, the audience to still know before we uh, we remove you from the screen here? Um... Uh, they can reach out to me on Twitter I will, uh, or on LinkedIn. I will be happy to uh, answer all their question, um, to to give them more information about something uh, related to AWS. Um, I, I just want uh, them to know that they can reach out to me. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you for your session there. I really enjoyed that one. Thank you. Have a great day. All yes, right. See you, see you, Bye.